Our uh, second speaker today is Dr. Jason Pearson, who is a new addition to our Department of Chemistry, having joined us just a year ago, January. Dr. Pearson is uh, originally from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. He obtained a Bachelor of Technology degree as well as a Bachelor of Science degree from Cape Breton University in 2003. In 2007, he graduated from Dalhousie University with a PhD in quantum chemistry, after which he moved to Australia to pursue postdoctoral studies at the Australia National University. We were able to lure him back. His work has appeared in nearly 20 scholarly journals, as well in a new book entitled Quantum Biochemistry. He has won awards from various national and international organizations, including the Canada Foundation for Innovation and the World Association of Theoretical and Computational Chemists. In the Department of Chemistry at UPEI, his current academic home, he leads a research team focused on computational modeling to answer key scientific questions. Dr. Pearson has given an abundance of public lectures on science and quantum mechanics throughout North America, Europe, and Australia. His presentation today will focus on how we can best use computers to make important discoveries in chemistry and beyond. Please join me in welcome Dr. Pearson. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Dean Curiel and Joe Valitum. I'm not, I know Dean Curiel is here. I'm not sure if Joe Valitum is here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I very much appreciate it. And I suppose the rest of you deserve a bit of an applause for coming to a quantum mechanics lecture at 7.30 in the morning. This is impressive. I know if I asked my students to do that, I wouldn't be the most popular professor in the university for sure. Um, when, I, when I was first told, I know that this is the 24th research breakfast, but it's my first, and I, I wasn't familiar with the concept, and when I was asked to come and speak about my research at 7.30 in the morning, I thought, <clears throat> surely I'd be relegated to a closet in the basement somewhere with a handful of people with nothing better to do, but this is really impressive. I, I really applaud your, your uh, get up and go to come and listen to me this morning. This is fantastic. So I am a quantum chemist, um, although I was careful to hide that from my title. Um, you can see that my affiliation is with the Department of Chemistry, and if you were reading my title, you might have thought that perhaps I was in the Department of Computer Science or something like that, but that's not true. I am a chemist, uh, and so before I start today, I want to start with a few ground rules. I, I really don't know what the background is of most of you, um, but I'm going to go on the assumption that we haven't all just recently graduated with a chemistry degree, and I want to start with some very basic tenets some rules for the day. Uh, and the first is that the universe is made of atoms. Atoms are the fundamental building blocks of literally everything we can see, smell, taste, touch, or hear. Uh, atoms can congregate themselves and connect in, in a myriad of ways and create what we call molecules. And literally everything we interact with on a daily basis, from my plastic clicker here to the fuel in my cars, they're all molecules. And so as chemists, we're very concerned with understanding these molecules, with understanding their properties, and also how they interconvert from one to another. How can we mix and match these atoms to change the molecules and therefore change the properties? Uh, this image here is, is not terribly important. It's one of the ones I use in my podcasts for first-year chemistry students, but we tend to represent atoms as little balls. So you can see a series of red balls here. Those are all oxygen atoms. And you can see a couple of green balls in the middle. Those are iron atoms. And this is typically how we draw them. You don't need to worry about all the rest of the stuff. But when I connect them in certain ways, for example, this is called iron oxide. And this is responsible for PEI's characteristic red soil. And so there's always something associated with a molecule that, that can give it macroscopic properties and something that we can see. And if we want a working definition for the day, I propose that we can think of something very familiar to us all, and those are Legos. Legos are very much like atoms, and we actually use this analogy in our first year chemistry class. Atoms have a wide variety. There are a wide variety of sizes, shapes, and colors that we can choose, and we can connect them in, in a seemingly infinite number of ways to get things with very, very different properties. So as long as we know that, that's your chemistry lesson for the day, I think we'll be fine for the rest of the morning. So as I mentioned, I'm a chemist, and if I were to ask you to think about what my lab looks like, you might conjure up an image like this. Of course, we've got our obligatory white lab coats and our goggles and our beakers and Bunsen burners and very fam fancy colored liquids and that sort of thing. This is what we think of, isn't it, when we think of a chemist? I know that because this is a, a picture from promotional material that the university has generated saying, 
look, this is our chemistry department. Come, come study here. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's a new breed of chemist, uh, and if this is the typical chemist, then the new breed of chemist would be an atypical chemist. This is Adam. He's toiling away on a problem that I've assigned to him, and he's in my research lab. And as you can see, he does not wear a white lab coat. He's got no gloves, no Bunsen burners, nothing like that. What we do is we use computers to do chemistry. We're, we are essentially simulation scientists. And so instead of mixing A and B and, and feeding it into an instrument and trying to see what we've made, we simulate that with using computers and very, very, um, very sophisticated software to do that. And we actually don't necessarily just use our desktop computers. We actually use very, very high-powered computers. These are called HPCs, or high-performance computing clusters. Uh, this is not ours, but the one we use looks very much like it. Uh, and these are massive networks of parallel architecture that can do very impressive things, really. These are the same sorts of computers that companies like Pixar use to make the, the latest Shrek movies, the latest Toy Story movies, which I'm very much looking forward to. They're interested in generating very high quality images and stitching them together seamlessly to make a film. We're interested in using massive and massive sets of data and distilling from that data chemically meaningful information. And so we've, in a sense, got you know, very similar goals. Now, you might ask, the first question is, what, what's the point? Why would anybody want to simulate chemistry? And that's an actually very good question. It was a question that was asked for quite a long time. This was originally sort of an academic curiosity. I wonder if we can do this. But nowadays it's actually become an essential tool to almost every chemical endeavor. Computational chemistry has two key advantages. The first one is that we can probe information that you can't get from experiments. Chemists, as I mentioned, are very interested in molecules, and they're also very interested in how molecules transition from one state to another state. And experimental techniques are very good at looking at what you start with, and they're also very good at looking at what you finish with, but they're comparatively poor at understanding how you transition from one to the other. Computers, on the other hand, have no problem doing this. We can simulate almost any reaction you can think of and, and literally watch it happen on our screen. And from that, you can get a lot of information about how molecules behave, and then from that comes perhaps tunability or the application of that knowledge to, to just about anything. The second uh, and perhaps most important feature of quantum chemistry or computational chemistry is that it's relatively cheap. And this is a, a very important thing if you're in the business of chemistry. Um, if you want it to do experiments, of course, you have to buy the chemicals you'd like to mix. You have to buy the instrumentation that's used to probe their structure. Uh, we don't have those types of problems. And perhaps the most uh, amplified example of where cost comes into play is probably the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, Dr. Dabigan was telling us about the pharmaceutical industry not too long ago. If I could add to his comments, uh, if you're going to develop a drug, and there are people that know far more about this than I do, but roughly three-quarters of the cost of developing a drug is in what we call the preclinical phase, which is the development phase, really the idea phase. Uh, and that's a very costly phase, incredibly costly, and it's also a very long phase. It takes at least a decade for most drugs that we take today uh, to have reached the market. And if if you're a good scientist in a pharmaceutical industry, what you might have done is, is imagined hundreds of thousands of compounds that may target the specific place you're looking for in the body. And if you thought of 100,000 compounds that may target the place you're looking for, then you've got to buy 100,000 compounds. Then you've got to test 100,000 compounds. This becomes incredibly expensive. But if you hire a computational chemist who can then simulate that 100,000 compound set and perhaps distill it to about a handful that, that has the best shot of actually working, well, then you've, you've made a significant improvement. And all pharmaceutical companies in the world now employ a team of computational chemists to do exactly that. And so it's been a, an incredibly useful tool as it's been developed. And this has been recognized by the Nobel Foundation. And in 1998, uh, Sir John Popel was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his developments of precisely this, doing chemistry with computers. Of course, he shared the, the Nobel Prize that year, uh, but also with another computational chemist. So um, the next question is, are we, are we finished? Is, have, we, have we created the perfect science, and can we now apply it to any problem we wish? What's left? What are the frontiers for computational chemistry? Well, I can assure you that there are many. 
Computational chemistry is not the be-all, end-all. It's not the final word. It's, a, it's another tool in the arsenal of science to try and tackle today's most important problems. Um, but what I want to propose is perhaps there is a new way, a new question, something, something brand new that we can ask of our computers. Yes, we can improve our existing algorithms, and yes, we can push the boundaries of what computational chemistry can do even further, but I would argue that there's perhaps a more profound uh, bit of information that we can tease out of our computers. And I want to illustrate that for you with uh, a couple of slides. I'm showing you here a, a pretty simple trial and error process. I don't think this is going to be a surprise to many people. We start with a problem. Perhaps we'd like a new fuel for our cars. Perhaps we'd like to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and we'd like to know how best to do that. Uh, you name it. Perhaps we'd like the, the cure for a headache that you're going to have after listening to me speak for 20 minutes. <laughs> Whatever we need, there's a problem, and what we rely on, what is pivotal to the solution of this process, is the idea phase, that light bulb moment. And we rely on our scientists and our engineers to come up with these brilliant ideas. Um, however, most of the time, they, they don't actually work. Once we come up with an idea, our job is then to test it, to prove its validity, and we're usually forced to conclude that it's either a success or a failure. And any scientist in the room, and I would argue any person in the room, can confirm that the road through failure is a well-beaten path. Almost every one of our ideas that we come up with end in failure, and then we cycle through this bottom, this bottom uh, loop here. Now, cycling through failure is an expensive process, not to mention a particularly frustrating one. Now, I would argue, if we understand the laws of quantum, quantum mechanics, can we change the structure of this? Can we use computers and ask them new questions? Right now, computers are relegated to the testing phase. If we come up with an idea, we can use computers to simulate our reactions and simulate our ideas and see if they work, rather than use actual experiments. But can we use more? And I propose we can. Can we have a problem and instead of giving our computer a molecule and saying, computer, is this the right molecule for the job? Does this have the right properties we need? Can we ask a different question? Can we go to our computer and say, computer, I need a molecule with these particular properties. I need something that will do this. And ask the question backwards. And if we ask the question backwards and our computer spits us out a molecule, well then, presumably, we're on a streamlined path to success. Uh, and so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in our lab that is toward this goal and toward asking different questions from our computers. Not, am I right or am I wrong, but let's take me out of the equation and say, computer, what is the optimal molecule to solve my problem? I'm going to tell you why this is a difficult challenge. It's a very difficult challenge because of this hideous beast. This is known as the periodic table of the elements. And you don't need to know much about it, except for the fact that each block in this periodic table is like a Lego, or it's like an atom. It's a choice that we have. If we want to build a molecule, we can choose from this play set. And there are about 100 atoms in that periodic table, give or take, a little bit more, but let's say 100. So if I want to choose one atom, I've got 100 different possibilities that I can choose, don't I? And if I want to create a molecule that's got two atoms, well, now I've got 100 for the first one, 100 for the second one. All of a sudden, I'm at uh, what I would call a formidable challenge. And that's only two atoms. Fast forward to 10, and we're already at a number that I don't know how to pronounce. And if you realize that most drug molecules on the market today contain at least 40 atoms, I don't have enough room on this slide to put the zeros that I would have to put. So the search through what we call chemical space, this is what we call chemical space. It's a very vast space and a very difficult one to search through. How do we find that optimum molecule? How do we find that best fuel, that miracle drug, through this vast sea of possibilities? Well, I'll show you how we're developing methods to do that. And this is the fundamental question. Is there a way to meaningfully search through that chemical space? Because if we simply sit in the sea of possibilities and pick one and test it and pick one and test it, well, then we haven't changed anything. We're simply doing the old, the old trial and error method again. So here's, here's some of the things we're thinking about in our lab. And this is called molecular design. Um, one of the most logical places to start is something that, and th this molecule has no specific significance. It's just a... Uh, a pretty molecule, so I, I put it up on the screen. But suppose we start with something, start with a molecule that can perform a task at least in a, in a moderate way. It may not be the best one to perform the job, but at least it, it has some sort of activity. This is perhaps one that has gone through the failure cycle, but 
maybe isn't so bad. What we're doing now is we're developing algorithms that if you know the process, if you know precisely what your molecule is meant to do, or what you want it to do, well, we can analyze the structure of this compound, and we can look for regions that are not contributing optimally to that process. Are there places, are there groups, chunks of Lego blocks that are not really helping me? Are they simply spectators? And if so, let's identify them. Once you identify those, we can then refer to a library of Lego pieces, a library of what we call functional groups. This, by the way, is a very small fraction of a library, but it illustrates my point. What we then do is take a large library like this and literally superimpose them all on top of each other in those positions that we determine need to be optimized. No, we're not substituting one after another. We literally put them all together. This is very difficult to imagine if you're sitting with a box full of Lego blocks and you want to put a hundred of them in one place. That's not very easy to do. But when we simulate things, there's no problem with that. And as we simulate the process with this new super molecule, with many, many things superimposed into the same position, we begin to see key candidates coming out. I'm not sure if you can see this. I've meant to have them highlighted as I press a button, but you can see a few are highlighted. The algorithm will selectively decide which of those many, many substituents, which of those many, many functional groups are actually helping this process. And once you do that, you can then return to your original molecule and you've designed a new one, and completely in silico. And your new molecule has increased properties, enhanced properties. It's an optimized molecule for the task that you're willing to try to, to solve. And so what really what we're doing here is, and this is alluding to my title, we're really unlocking the crystal ball that's within our computers. We are, we are removing the necessity for us to continuously and continuously generate new ideas and allowing our computer, that knows very well the laws of physics, design the molecule that's optimum for the process that we're interested in. And so that's really, that's really sort of the focus of, of what we're heading towards in our lab. And if I were to leave you with a couple of take-home messages today, uh, the first one would be that chemistry can, and very often is, done with computers. This might be a new lesson for everyone, so I thought that's probably a pertinent thing to mention. But of course, the more exciting thing is that computers may very soon lead chemical development. And so the next pill you take may not have been designed by somebody wearing a white lab coat, but may have been designed by a silicon processor chip. And I think that's a very interesting, uh, interesting horizon. So anyway, um, despite the fact that we all live on one, no man is an island, and there's a lot of people that I deserve to thank for, for a lot of their contrib contributions. Uh, several students, uh, one of which is here, actually. Um, many collaborators from various parts of the world. Uh, funders, of course, uh, none of this is possible without that money. And of course, our, our high-performance computing resources largely come from a network called the Atlantic Computational Excellence Network. So, of course, they deserve many thanks, too. And also thanks to you, and I'd be happy to address any questions that you have. Thank you.